let's go live close live let's go why can i not see the comments where is the comment section what's up everybody we are live but i don't have my video editor here for me to be able to see comments on screen so i can't really see what you guys are saying so we're gonna get into first the t-shirt giveaway let's go over it j fishman 9710 commented on the never before seen speed exercise video and then mark p mcguire is this the mark mcguire mark p mcguire fit and athletic video you guys both of you are the t-shirt giveaway winner so that means all you have to do is email us at support at garage strength.com take a picture of your youtube channel send that in an email okay and you can take a picture of that studio and when you take a picture of the studio you can blank out the the revenue in there and let us know that this is indeed you you are mark p mcguire and you are j fishman 9710 so that you guys can claim your t-shirts and we'll send out those t-shirts right afterwards i'm still trying to figure out how i can see these comments but i can't see them currently i hear my video editor he might be coming okay so here we go questions we've got a lot of really good questions i want to go over and then after those questions get hit we're going to go into everything that you guys have in the chat box so the first big question none none 4885 this is from the speed exercises for athletes okay this is a, actually a question that just came in uh that we saw i want to say like two or three days ago but it's off of an old video from like a year and a half ago any advice or workouts for tactical athletes so tactical athlete think about someone uh, training for the military, training for, um, I mean, even a police officer, firefighter, um, but tactical athlete also could mean, you know, you're, it's almost like the modern day biathlon where they're doing really cool um, sort of like obstacle courses and then doing shooting drills along those lines as well. And even some knife work. Um, anyway, currently in the army have to be good at running long distance, five miles in 38 minutes or less. Okay, so that's pretty good. That's a pretty good clip. What's that? Seven and a half. Yeah, seven and a half. A little bit less than seven and a half minute miles for five miles. Uh, two minute push ups need at least 75 in two minutes. Sit ups, he needs at least 75. Um, strength. Strength ho. Would I program this? Is actually the comment <laughs> strength ho. But what I would do is, and I have a paper here. Okay, that I wanted to bring up. And Jason, can you, uh, the comments I cannot see on the screen. Right. So this this research paper right here is going to be a, a good example or a good answer for none, none, 48, 85. Um, Ant-Man XX, I just see you commented about the hurling video. The hurling video is being filmed this week. I've been spending too much time researching the sport, uh, but it is being filmed this week, which I believe puts us middle of August is when it's going to come out. Okay, so this this study, okay, this study right here, the effect of speed, endurance, and strength training on performance, running economy, and muscular adaptation. So this would be if you're a tactical athlete, what can you do in training to optimize your endurance and still optimize if you have to do push-ups, if you have to do sit-ups? Okay, so basically they took 16 male endurance runners and they measured their VO2 max. Uh, they were randomly assigned to either a combined strength uh, and, and uh, speed endurance training program. Um, or a control okay so for eight weeks the css replaced their normal moderate intensity training with a speed endurance program okay so speed endurance program and and that included so they do that twice a week and then they would do strength training two times a week as well as well as aerobic uh, high capacity and moderate capacity or moderate intensity training with a reduction in volume of about 58 percent okay so what does that mean the results in the uh, 400 meters in the yo-yo intermittent recovery test performance was improved by five percent 
uh, during the intervention group. Maximal aerobic speed was 0.6 kilometers higher, and the maximal activity of lactate dehydrogenase was 17% higher after after compared to before the intervention period. Somebody should have done some work on this research paper here with their actual grammar. Uh, time to exhaustion and, and peak blood lactate during an incremental treadmill test was 9% and 32% uh, higher um, compared to the intervention group. So 10K performance, maximum oxygen uptake, and running economy were unchanged. So the conclusion is adding strength and speed endurance along with a reduced training volume. So strength and speed endurance can improve short-term exercise capacity and induce muscular adaptations related to anaerobic capacity in endurance trained runners. So this study right here is essentially showing us that if you have to run a five miles, and this sounds wild, but this is, you know, not an absurdly long distance and if you run five miles and that's your test and you add in a little bit like twice a week of strength work okay and you decrease your volume of running a little bit about like between five to ten percent so you decrease that by a little bit and you also put in some speed endurance work like 400 meter sprints you will see a better performance in Okay, you will see a better performance in short term exercise capacity uh, and muscular adaptations all related to anaerobic capacity. So uh, essentially, you're going to be able to increase your maximum o maximum oxygen uptake um, and you're going to run faster and probably decrease that time. So what that means then for somebody who wants to improve their five mile test would be, let's say you're running 25 to 30 miles a week. Let's decrease that to 20 miles a week. And you have one long run that is, let's say, like a 10-mile run, 10 to 12 miles. And then that leaves you with eight miles left for the week. And you would essentially spread that out over a medium intensity and a higher intensity. So you'd have one, one session that would be devoted to like 400-meter sprints. Okay, so let's say you get uh, eight 400-meter sprints in, something like that. That's two miles. And then you can do a moderate intensity where you do, you know, like a four-mile uh, let's say you run a three mile test rest for 15 minutes and a three mile test. Now that's some, another way that you could be, uh, improving your running economy. And you can also add in those push up tests, you know, um, uh, improving your dips and pulling your, um, improving your pull-ups. And that's going to help enhance that over a long period of time. Um, so that's something that I wanted to bring that up. That was from none, none 48, 85. Now we're going to get into the old classic. Is there a corresponding... Is there a corresponding clap push-up exercise to increase weighted pull-ups? Good videos. Keep it up. That's good because I got I got roasted probably more on the clap push-up video than I've ever been roasted before. Uh, people are like, oh, that doesn't work. Says who? And, of course, the ego inside of me just wants to respond with says all of the freak athletes that I have here that can bench 400 to 500 pounds. And most of these kids are still in high school benching 315 to 400 pounds literally just by doing the clap push-ups i was getting so annoyed listen to this one i was getting so annoyed that i was going to meet with my on-site manager and we have a test period coming up here shortly with our our on-site high school athletes so we were going to do a test and then i wanted to implement 50 clap push-ups at the end of every single workout for the next eight weeks and then test again and see what happens with the bench what do you guys think about that? That'd be a freaking cool test, but let's get back to that. Um, is there a corresponding clap push-up exercise to increase weighted pull-ups? And so this was from uh, Halas Zetamas 623. Okay, and this was from last week. Halas Zetamas 623. I don't know if you're in here today. I see Xander in there. I see, did I see Anonymous? I wanted to see if Anonymous was in there. Uh, Audacious, Rambler, Beck. Uh, nice going to vacation. Johnny Jones is in there. G great to see all the all the the, the typicals. Uh, I haven't seen Mark McGuire in here yet. Um, okay, so daily versions of pull-ups. What I would do is I would try and look at all right, what pull-up exercises don't don't really bug the shoulder. So neutral grip pull-ups uh, and chin-ups. Sometimes high ring pull-ups are absolutely fantastic. And so what I would do, and and this is totally like as transparent as possible five days a week i would try to hit daily okay so we would go a neutral grip pull up okay we do a chin up we call them curl up so you can do a curl up 
and you try to get 25 to 40 reps every single day. Um, and then what I would then do is let's say day three, we just hit like 20 to 25 pull-ups. So let's go neutral grip pull-up day one. We try and get the 40 reps. Okay. Day two, we're doing chin-ups. We try to get the 40 reps day three. We're doing a high ring pull-up or a neutral grip pull-up. And we're just doing, you know, let's say four sets of five, we're getting to 20 reps. Then we take a day off. We come back into the gym. And then what I would do is I would do, um, if I'm trying to get 25, let's say six sets of four weighted. Okay. Six, six sets of four weighted pull-ups. And then the very next day, I might be a little bit sore the first time I do this, but after the third, fourth and fifth week, I would, so on day five, I would do a rep test. I would literally just try and bang out as many pull-ups as I can. So you could do like, let's say three sets of four to warm up and then a rep test. Uh, we actually just did a rep test ourselves here um, at Garage Strength with uh, myself. I, I hit 18, I think 18 dead hang pull-ups. So I was pretty happy about that. Shelby Mustangs, another good one. And I just realized there's two more questions. Shelby Mustangs, exercises to run longer. Okay, so exercises to run longer. I know this is a specific question. I'm gonna put this up on, because this is not, okay, so this is X, This is actually for rowers, yes. Ooh, this is an interesting, ro uh, rowing biomechanics and physiology. And so if we have any understanding of rowing, okay, so check out this study right here rowing, biomechanics, physiology, and the hydrodynamic aspect around rowing. So a lot of rowing is going to be based off of one, your, your posture, the, two, how the blade is going to be entering the water. That's going to be playing a major role. Okay. If, if you're sitting, uh, if, if the blades entering in the, in a bad dynamic into the water, which is the hydrodynamic, it's going to cut poorly. Okay. And then you're not going to actually execute a proper row, which can have a negative impact on that, that rowing dynamic. And so the question from Shelby Mustangs is, I know this is a specific question that you might not have had before, but what strength training do you think would be beneficial for a rower when it comes to explosiveness and it comes to force? Okay, so according to numerous studies, rowing performance is influenced by several factors. Okay, several factors in the paper. This paper here that is right here up on the screen breaks down those several factors. And the big aspect is going to come back to uh, hydrodynamic force, um, physiology. Um, let's see here, rowing mechanisms in terms of rowing anthropometry or blade to accelerate the generated by the ore blade. Um, I'll include studies. Okay. So the big aspect here is that based on the information obtained and understanding the important aspects of the rowing mechanism was achieved to provide an update of the comprehensive, uh, comprehensive improvement. And so if I'm looking at somebody who's a rower, the biggest aspect that I'm going to look for in rowing, okay, specific. So we're, th we're talking about crew here would be what's their hip mobility like? What's their lower back strength, their lower back strength endurance, and what kind of hamstring strength do they have, and what, what type of endurance do they have in their quads, okay, and lats. Lats are going to play a huge role, um, and I, I immediately start to think about, so the question was more explosive and stronger. So immediately, if we have a rower, the, the area that this person specifically, Shelby Mustangs, is saying they don't care about endurance. They care about strength and explosiveness, okay? So we're throwing endurance out the window. They've got that covered. If I'm focusing on the rowing positions of somebody who part participates in crew, right, I want to improve with a narrow stance squat. So I'm going to look at it and be like, we need to enhance their mobility to be almost identical to where their foot position is going to be when they're driving in in the boat okay then we've got to think about okay when the blade enters where are their lats okay are they lengthened all right well then we also have to think about on both hands because they're not canoers they're rowers on both hands where are their hands in relation what's the relation what is the relationship when the blades enter the water and then what's the relationship relative to the lats and to their hips okay so i want to do close grip or close stance squats okay the stance should mimic where they're at when they're in the boat okay i want to do close stance or at least have that mimic sports specificity to snatch high pulls uh, to clean high pulls 
um, to close grip snatches, okay, to deadlifts, okay, and then we want to have that posture, that lower back posture be very similar in a lat position. So for strength, I might think about like a dumbbell RDL with an actual row, okay, and I've, we've shown and demonstrated some of those exercises before. Uh, we are, again, I would, I would do even potentially command uh, squats off of a box, okay, in with a closer stance. I would do close grip pull-ups um, based off of where the hand position is going to be, close grip uh, high ring pull-ups. Uh, I would do rope climbs to improve that explosiveness. I would do jumps from that same position. So it's going to be trying to identify the foot position, trying to identify the, the hand position, trying to identify how long their lats are when they're in the compressed mode with, with their quads and with their lower back. And then we would do really, really, really high rep uh, reverse hypers. And so that would be the main way to, for me to break down rowing. And the, big, the other big factor is their nutrition's got to be on point. So in, in rowing, we don't want big, massive rowers that are you know 230 pounds. We want their relative strength to be out of this world. So they've got to be dialed in with their nutrition. Uh, they've got to be dialed in with their sleep and recovery. And that's going to help optimize things. And I, I would actually even look at someone like Jakob Ingebrigtsen's training for endurance and try and do something similar. So like a, a double lactic. Uh, so they, they call it double lactic uh, threshold training that he's doing. And I would try and implement something similar to that um, with rowers. Okay. So I wanted to share that. Now we're going to get into one more question quick before we dive into uh, – everything that you guys are asking right now um and that question is coming from good guy mario good guy mario so guys remember you guys comment on these things i on, on all of our videos let's see if this is i don't think this is live yet Ooh, now we can go live live on instagram can actually happen so when you guys go when you guys actually comment on the videos what ends up happening is that here we go i'm gonna put my face right up here there we go when you comment, it comes through the YouTube studio. And then I see these things on a regular basis. And oftentimes I'll take a screenshot, send it over to uh, our video editor, say, hey, look, this is a great question. We got to talk about this question. He'll put it into the meeting notes uh, for the YouTube live. And, you know, it's a, it's a good way for us to get a good pulse. Matty Denny in the room. What's up, Matt? Big throw in London, baby. Um, I just was making fun of Sam today, actually, about that. Uh, so... When you guys comment on the YouTube videos, we, we see those comments and they come in. So this is good guy Mario coming in with this sweet question. And I'm going to also add this up on the, uh, this question is, yeah. Here, hey, I don't know if you've done any video or shorts, but how would you structure a conditioning cardio session with calisthenic movements? Um, here we go. This is a good one. Okay. So calisthenic movements so that we can get those heart rates elevated and get in some volume. And so I'm assuming good guy Mario is talking about um, he's very likely, and I tried to bring this up where it's, if this study here, the effects of running specific strength training, endurance training, and concurrent training on recreational endurance athletes' performance. Okay, so I believe good guy Mario is trying to say if we're doing almost like circuits, okay, one thing I will say, here's a sweet plug, is that, yes, does floor press actually help 100%? A, a really, really interesting thing here that we've got going on inside of athletic fitness in peak strength. Okay, so if you download peak strength, then you can click on athletic fitness. And in athletic fitness, you can see you'll get specific workouts that have like circuit day. Okay, so when you have that circuit day, dude, that's exactly what good guy Mario is asking here. And this study here, so guys on Instagram, uh, you can't see this study, but on YouTube, you can see the effects of running in, in specific strength training. Okay, so some of the big factors here is that the basic conclusion is that when we can train a 12 week concurrent training program integrated into specific types of periodization. Okay, so in, in the, the periodization that they're essentially uh, discussing is ATR. Okay. So that's accumulation, transmutation, and realization. I don't, uh, transmutation to me is such a, I know it's a, I know why they use that word, but I, I've always just felt it's a weird word for ATR periodization. Uh, so this effectively improves body composition and performance variables that can be obtained with exclusive running specific strength and endurance training. Okay. And this is in recreational runners ages 30 to 40. 
I fall into that bracket and I'm a recreational runner right now. So if we're doing uh, recreational training for endurance work, right? And let's say we sprint or let's say we go out and we hit um, a 5K. So we run a 5K. Uh, after we run a 5K, we're doing five jump lunges on each leg, um, 15 clap push-ups, 15 squats, and then we're going to rest for five minutes and then we're going to run another 5K that's essentially like the style of concurrent training that i believe good guy mario is talking about however this study uh they did set things up a little differently where they they had specific sessions devoted to endurance work so three days a week was endurance work and then on non-consecutive days three days a week was strength-based work okay so it's relatively easy to lay that out and if your mileage is between 10 and 20 miles and you're still lifting, you know, two to three days a week, you're going to see a, a pretty big uh, per performance and improvement. Running specific strength training enhances maximum and explosive strength and running economy. OK, whereas exclusively just doing endurance training improves VO2 max. Uh, it improves a n t. OK, and I'm trying to find if we go into which is anaerobic threshold, we go and then resistance exercises. Okay. So one thing that we got to do is if we, if we look at it, we go, all right, we know that if we break this down, okay, we know that endurance training is going to help with the VO2 max. We know it's going to help with uh, anaerobic threshold. We also know that strength work is going to help with running economy and it's gonna help with explosive strength. So ideally, we figure out some way to piece this together, and that's what I think is one of the coolest parts. Again, going back to the athletic fitness when we're answering this question from Good Guy Mario is that we have a concurrent system in app form to hold you accountable to get your ass out there and go do 25 minutes, go try and hit a, a really good 5K, okay? To, to still continue to do uh, that specific strength work. Uh, and improve your overall endurance-based training. Uh, but also, if you don't want to use it for endurance-based work, you can use it for building muscle and just getting more swole. So I wanted to share that stuff, those, those questions with you. Great questions this week on the, on the YouTube videos. Um, and again, if you guys comment on the YouTube videos, I see them come through the YouTube studio and I like looking at them. It gives me a good pulse about what you guys want to, to talk about, what you guys want to get, get discussing. Uh, and now we're going to dive into, I'm looking at my computer screen right now. Johnny Jones in the chat, Kingsley 14 Okiki. Hey, Dan, greetings from Spain. And thanks a lot for your good works. I'm into CrossFit and your YouTube channel has improved my snatch. Dude, thank you or you're welcome. And also thanks for, for participating and everything being in here. Um, you know, I think that's one of the big factors too, is that a lot of the reason why we do the YouTube live is one, so we can get to meet you guys help you out and if you are a crossfitter or you're a weightlifter or you're a thrower you're a football player you're a wrestler we can help you along your journey to attain that peak strength okay so let's get into this johnny jones could you consider a basketball player an endurance athlete in a way <sighs> yeah yes that's a great question um francis is in here uh francis nagano i would say as far as basketball with an endurance athlete yeah i think the the wild part is how much they run in a in a given game, uh, the distance that they run. You know, it's it's not as much as soccer or football, um, but yeah, that's a that's I would train basketball players almost like endurance jumpers. Okay, so if I took like a a, a long jumper or a high jumper that and I created their basic model for for training. And then I would sort of tweak it with about with like an 800 to a 400 meter guy. That would be the individual I would try and mold uh, into into playing basketball because um, you still want them to be extraordinarily explosive. OK, next question here. Kingsley. OK, K, that's the one we just covered. Super prime 117. When training for power, we often look at the formula mass times acceleration equals force equals mass times acceleration. So does max strength also contribute to the mass uh, max strength would contribute to mass because through the mechanism of mechanical tension uh, we will increase some type of mass based off of uh, mechanical tension mechanical loading will increase hypertrophy which can in turn increase mass so yes 
Do you recommend periodization cycles of hypertrophy and strength for wrestling athletes? This is from a relevant user. So a relevant user, what I like to do, and I, I do all the strength and conditioning for South Dakota State uh, University. They just this past year, they had eight guys make it to the NCAA tournament. And one of the big things that we did throughout the year, and we're doing even right now, is that when we're setting it up, okay, lightweight, middleweight, heavyweight, I try to make it as simple as possible as far as the system of training goes. And then we want to look at each weight class. And then you can say, okay, this kid's a 133 pounder, but he's walking around right now at 158. 160 he cannot get any bigger we need to make sure that his training is more dialed into relative strength more dialed into um, keeping his pound for pound strength as optimal as possible okay whereas if we have a guy who's a 197 pounder and they're trying to transition up to heavyweight well we've got to get him to gain 20 to 25 pounds so we've got to increase his back squat we got to increase volume with his back squat we got to get his bench press up we got to clean heavier so that is going to be more focusing on hypertrophy. So to answer your question, we've got to actually identify what weight class are they in? Where's their body weight in the off season? And then can we hammer hypertrophy or is their body weight too high in the off season? And we can't hammer hypertrophy. So the one big factor around parabolic periodization, and, and we go into this in, inside of garage strength program design is that when we're looking at training, okay, if I look at the exposure phase for the athlete who's a 125 or a 133 pounder and they're too heavy, they're still going to have to focus on their relative strength and they're going to have higher volume, but it's not going to necessarily be like super hypertrophic uh, where we're trying to get like a big lactate response, a big, huge pump, big sarcoplasmic growth. That's a different, a slightly different style of training, but we still would use uh, hypertrophy based training in other instances. Uh, Rambler. For my one rep max, my squat, my one rep max back squat, should I notate? Should I notate the one rep max between parallel and ass to grass squats? Also, should I attempt front squat one RMs for future percentages? Same for overhead press. Okay. The big factor here is that the one reason out, outside of the fact that ass to grass squats are just simply better. Um, and we've talked about how they have a positive impact on sprinting speed for elite level soccer players. We've talked about how they have uh, a great carryover to we've we've done the research. We've shown you the research where they have a great carryover to a greater vertical jump uh, and improve uh, amortization phase and the counter movement. OK, so we've discussed that outside of that, when we're using squats for testing, OK, if we're doing ass to grass full range of motion squats, we know that every single test is going to be the same. Okay. We know that when we tested the previous time, we had full range of motion. When we're testing this time, we're doing full range of motion. One of the downfalls, and we're going to react to some of these, these, uh, these squats that I've seen at the power five level you watch, and I'm going to bring up Penn state's, uh, defensive tackle busted out like mid bar. It was like a mid bar squat, 600 pounds for four ass to grass. Okay. So his test, we always know is going to be ass to grass. Then you look at somebody, not to put Wisconsin on blast, but Wisconsin was, you know, touting their big squats and half their guys were squatting above parallel. And it's like, well, if they're going above parallel, can you really see like, what if it's above parallel for this test? And then the next test, it's a little bit below parallel. You know, you, you have a negative response or a negative. You're not really doing the same test every time. And that's not going to help with your uh, that's not going to help you quantify the ability of your system of training. So ass to grass tests is how you should be testing your squat. Now you still need to control the eccentric. You shouldn't just be plopping down, falling forward, losing that trunk control. You've got to have good tension. You've got to have good technique. And that's where I would even say, you know, testing your front squat for sure. I actually think front squat tests are safer than back squat tests, by the way. Um, okay. Could you explain what are different speeds, tempos that you should be training at? Uh, ooh, this is a good question because we sort of have a video coming out on this on rate coding, actually. And so rate coding, if we could think about and, and you guys comment in here, if you understand rate coding, uh, Keist, I have done fight camp weight cutting. Um, so if we understand rate coding to be getting the potentiating the muscle to fire more rapidly when we're under tension or when we are doing a rapid movement. OK, so if we would look at rate coding and this is I'm going to try and answer this question because uh, the, the question for for tempos and speed, 
you can look at rate coding as simple as velocity decrement with a sled. Okay, so sled training at about 30% decrement can lead to faster sprints in an acute setting without a sled. Okay, that's a form of rate coding. Another form of rate coding could be uh, doing an eccentric squat with eccentric hooks. The hooks come off and you do a faster back squat after the hooks come off. Uh, so the concentric portion is faster. That's a form of rate coding. It's a potentiation that leads to rate coding. Another thing that could be based off of set to set would be something like a one six method. We have a whole video on the one six method. So you do, you know, a set of a single at 90% and then you do a set of six at 77%. Then you do a single at 92 and a half and then you do a set of six at 80%. Then you do a single at 95%. You do a six RM at like 83, 84%. Now all of a sudden, that's rate coding. Uh, so the speeds there are going to be uh, very different between the heavier and the lighter speeds. But what will end up happening is that if we have proper tempo, and we have proper understanding, um, we're going to be able to increase our max strength, our strength speed, our power output, and all of those things. Um, so Super Prime 117, to answer that question, I think it really comes down to identifying in specific athletes, where's their weakness, where, where do they individually struggle? You know, do they struggle in a unilateral position? Cause if they do, then we're going to use that to increase their overall speed out, out on the field. Um, you know, and there's actual research that will show that we're going to go into that deeper probably next week. Um, the single, the single, the single best exercise to increase speed. We should do the, the an, an entire study on that. I mean, there's studies on that. Um, okay, so peanut butter risking. Peanut butter risking. What's up, Coach? Thoughts on Jason Blaha? Wait, who's Jason Blaha? I should get my phone out here, and I should just Google this. Sometimes I'm not entirely up on the... Uh, Oh, he looks like a total savage. I mean, he's probably good. He looks like a a master's power lifter. Yeah, so I don't I don't know enough about Jason Blaha to comment on him. I, I I'm sorry about that. Do you think it's possible to train specific and general strength, power, speed, and endurance a little bit in every session, or is it better to have periodization for advanced athletes? So you would have periodization for athletes no matter what. Okay. Um, I would look at it and say, you can have endurance to a point we've, we've done an entire long form video on endurance training prior to a training session can actually elicit more hypertrophy. So there are unique ways to do that. I also think just making sure that they're in, uh, the same system of training. I think that you can do it in different sessions as well. Um, I would look at it as different sessions. So in one session we can knock off, uh, you know, explosiveness and max strength. And then in another session, we could knock off speed-based training and potentially some endurance work. That's the way I would set that up. Medi is coming in. What's up, Medi? What was Lucas Warning's squat and bench press record before he started to work with me? Lucas Warning's <laughs> bench press and squat record. Lucas Warning's bench press record was probably 135 pounds. Uh, now he's benched, I want to say, 520. Uh, he could probably squat 215 to 225. Now he can just, now he just tripled 210 on the front squat. So he can back squat uh, 600 pounds. He's cleaned uh, 190 kilos, which is like 430 pounds. Uh, Lucas Warning, I would say, is probably one of our best like transformations that, that we've ever had here at Garage Strength. Like a really, really big time transformation. Um, I hope that helps Medi. Samuel, what up, coach? How do I get my back squat up from 160 to 200 kilos in two years as a football player? I think this is great. So Samuel, I, I would want to know how old are you, first of all? And if we would lay out so he wants to increase by 40 kilos in two years. This is reasonable. I think this is great, too. Xander, I'll get to some of your, your questions here. Uh, and Keith, I will get into that question around flight camp. Um, but oftentimes we ask questions that are just absurdly, um, ag absolutely absurd. Like, I want to bench press 60 pounds more in the next three weeks. And it's like, that's not going to happen. But what can happen is 40 kilos in two years on your back squat. And the first step that I would do, and Samuel is saying he's 17 years old, he can back squat 160. So I would try and take, 
you know, what's your three rep max? What's your five rep max? You're squatting ass to grass. How frequently are you squatting? And take note of that. Write everything down. What's my ones? My singles of 160. My triples is, you know, let's say probably like a 145 triple. And then my five rep max is probably 140. Okay. So the big goal first would be, all right, let's set up an eight week block. And I'm going to add in two extra squatting days. And those two extra squatting days can be variation days. So it can be a pause squat. It can be a pause to a box. It can be a front squat. It can be a single leg squat, anything along those lines. But if, if we're doing a 225 pound front squat translates to like a 275, 280 back squat, if we're going to do that, okay, then we want to push. I want to try and push your five rep max during that eight weeks. So I want to get your five rep max up to 150. Okay. That's, that would be the goal. Let's get that up to 150. Let's add 10 kilos to your 5RM. So that would mean some of those pauses might only be singles or doubles, and we're going to try and push those pauses a little bit heavier. There's going to be another day where we do a 5RM that's going to be you know unbroken. And so the main focus is that if you're giving yourself a year and a half to two years to increase by 40 kilos in the back squat, identify the, where you're at, know the benchmarks that you need to get to. If you need to hit a 200-pound or 200-kilo back squat, that means you should triple – that means, first of all, that you should probably front squat like 160. Um, that should be another goal that you have to front squat 160. You should also triple probably 185, and you should probably hit a 5RM of 175 to 170. So those are number, numbers, benchmarks that you're going to work towards, okay? And then you build up, and then you can see – you can play this game over two years like – all right, well, I'm this far off on my 5RM or I'm closing the gap on my 5RM, but my three rep max is backing off. So I got to increase my three rep max. And then you can start to see correlations between, oh, when I do a, a double bounce squat, my double bounce improves my back squat. And you just go back and forth. Because the other big factor is what hard, what's hard with the sport like weightlifting is that you're trying to increase a snatch, a clean, a bench, or not a bench, but a, a jerk, all those those different lifts. If you're just trying to hammer, um, if you're just trying to hammer your back squat, you can make your entire program around that. Uh, so, so let me know what you think about that. Uh, if that helps at all, uh, Samuel, let me know. Rookie, head coach, I've been having low back pain when I'm squatting and def and deadlifting. I believe it's spine flexion intolerance. How should I tweak my workouts to where I can train without bothering? I would do see if you feel it when you're doing front squats. How do you feel when you're doing reverse hypers? And do you feel it when you're doing single leg squats? That would be my big question. Xander, thoughts on the assault air runner treadmill? I think it's good. I do think it's very good. I'm a basketball player trying to get more explosive. I use it for sprints. That's great. Tempo runs in a zone two jog. Do you think that will make me explosive? I don't think a tempo run will make you explosive. I don't think a zone two jog will make you explosive. I think they will help you tremendously with your anaerobic threshold. And I think they're going to help you a lot with your endurance. I think the sprints will help you. I think... Learning how to do a high hang snatch, a dumbbell snatch, a trap bar jump, a back squat, a front squat to a box, and even a hang power clean. That's the way you're going to get more explosive along with doing more jumps. Have you ever done fight camp weight cutting? Seems to be almost a field in itself, losing 10 to 20 pounds in one week without losing physical attributes. So, Keist, I believe 10 to 20 pounds is too much without you would you would lose physical attributes unless you're on some type of performance enhancement, which wouldn't surprise me for most guys. Um, typically, what you would say is five to seven percent cut uh, is where you're going. That's from what the research will show us. That's essentially the data would would point that that's when you're going to start to see a diminishment in performance. And a lot of guys will even see as well, it's also what is added post weigh-in. So a lot of guys that, let's say they cut 10 pounds, which is somewhat reasonable. It's not that bad in a week uh, because of water weight and whatnot. The issue is the then added surplus. So let's say I'm cutting to 210. Okay, so I cut down to 210 pounds. And then when I weigh in, I'm 210. But then I go and I weigh 217 the next day versus I just weigh 215 the next day. A lot of the information is telling us that the more you gain, the worse you're going to be. Uh, so that's something that we've just got to keep in mind. But it is a very unique balance. Um, I also think that they, they could do a better job of of doing that. Um, Mehdi, is that a real question that you're asking me right now? Um, yeah, 
That would be my answer, Keith. I, I I think it's it's a little bit out of hand though. How much does it take to how much does it normally take to reach a hundred kilos in the bench press? Hacker world, we know what what that takes. If you bench press twice a week and you hit pull ups twice a week and every single night you're doing fifty clap push ups and you try to also maximize your dips. So let's say on one of those bench days. Your, your next strength exercise is going to be dips. And then on the other bench day, your next strength exercise is going to be something like a close grip incline. And you're always doing some type of antagonistic work like a pull-up or a row. And if you're doing those 50 clap push-ups, you will bench 225 depending upon where you're at. But typically within 12 to 15 weeks. You know, if you're at 185, you'll blow that out of the water within the next six weeks most likely. I would say six weeks. How much, how much LSD... How much LSD does hinder your impulse? Okay, so impulse would be how much force are you putting out in a short period of time? Ironically, because we're doing uh, no problem, uh, Basti, because when we're running, running itself is impulse-based training, essentially. The, the concept of impulse is working when we're running. But optimizing it for, um, for athletes – What's a characteristic that you've seen a smaller athlete that has stood out to you? Smaller athletes can squat more and they can usually, they tend to be able to take a very large amount of volume relative to uh, taller athletes. But if we get back to, um, let's go back to this question (coughs) as far as LSD work. I think if you're doing LSD work twice a week, as long as you're still doing concurrent resistance-based training, and guys, this takes us back to the, the studies that we showed you uh, earlier in the in the in the actual live, um, those studies will show you that if you're doing resistance based training, you're doing plyometrics, you're doing concurrent ba- based training, you shouldn't see a drop off in that. You should actually be able to handle that along with that LSD work. I wanted to see Keist had a question earlier that I wanted to see that I thought I remembered. Um, you guys should do a vlog style on the Peak Channel following an athlete, new guy or girl, and continue it for over a year with a monthly update test. Wow, that would be a lot of commitment. That's a really good idea, though, Keist. It's funny. We just had a girl, uh, all-state girl in, in uh, softball we were talking about that we, you know, we're, we're so good at promoting some of our athletes and so bad at promoting, like, the ones that you just would never think. Zach Sarwar. Slow eccentric one and a quarter into unbroken reps on the bench press. So he's saying slow, 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 up, slow, boom, 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 boom. In fat grip curls got me going crazy in bouldering. That's great. Fat grips on everything have been pivotal for increasing motor unit activation in my arms. Yo, do we have the garage grips up here? I want to reveal something that is not going to be available right now because we're still in some testing protocols, but I can show you, hopefully. Um, is it good to do unbroken rapid deadlifts on impulse day? Yes. So impulse day, what I would do is instead of deadlifts, I would stop doing them and I would do on an impulse day like a low hang clean or a trap bar jump or a, or a hang power snatch. Thanks, Trevor. So... Um, the question around bouldering. Uh, so it was slow eccentric one and a quarter reps. Okay, so let's let's walk you through this. Slow eccentric, one and a quarter, up, and then boom. And then a slow eccentric, one and a quarter, up. And it's like constant tension, constant tension. And then he's saying that hitting that with the fat grips, okay? So we've got our garage grips here. These are going to be available within the next month. And he was saying fat grip. Garage grip curls have him just blowing up out when he's bouldering uh, because of the the motor unit recruitment. And actually, even just potentiating and, and using a fatter grip can help with rate coding. Okay, so this is about to be released on site along with some other cool things that we're, we're about to release. So these will be available soon. I'll just put these right the product placements right there how's that product place i'm wearing my kim stanball jersey i don't know if you guys saw this kim got third last year at the crossfit games for masters division 
she trains here at Garage Strength, um, and she got me this shirt to sport because uh, she's an absolute beast. She also trains with us with our weightlifters uh, four days a week, total animal. Uh, Sarah Fain is training system. Medi, come on. Okay, James, what goes into having elite shiftiness, someone like Jameer Gibbs? I think when you're looking at uh, somebody who's shifty um, – and, and extremely mobile and agile we've got to look at their ankles okay so power uh power and direction is coming from the ankles so if we've got mobile ankles okay if we've got strong calves which also uh so if we got strong calves mobile ankles that's going to change our shin angle and that's also going to change what we're doing with our loading relative to our quads relative to our glutes okay so if we're very shifty uh and we we have those that mobility in our ankle that can lead us to uh, recruiting our quads more effectively so the more mobile our ankles are the more agile we'll be out on the field basketball court you know wherever it is that you are as an athlete so that's also where doing single leg squats but then changing the degree or changing where you're placing your foot can be can play a major role um Medi is asking if he can buy the program, our, our peak strength with Bitcoin. I don't think that you can. Muhammad Tyson coming in. I do up to five hours, three times a week of zone two to four. So that would be, um, let's say, 125 uh, beats per minute up to 160. Uh, heavy lifting twice a week and sprints twice a week. Is that balanced enough? I think that's a great program. I think that's a fantastic program. I think you could do... Maybe you could lift three days a week and you could do those sprints still twice a week and maybe you do two and a half of the of the zone two of the zone two to zone four. When you're writing a training program, how long do you use a specific exercise uh, before replacing it? So I, I think it depends on the athlete. I think that some athletes need longer times. Yo, Timmy throws. Timmy Cat. Why are you in here to sit, dropping the seven, Tim? How are you doing? Uh, so a lot of athletes... There, there's and this is something that I've done poorly in some programs uh, in the past where I might switch a specific movement. So let's say we're doing like a banded stand, right? Like a, a real simple movement or for a weightlifter, we're doing uh, a specific, I mean, for a pole vaulter, let, let's say for a pole vaulter, like a muscle up, something along those lines, right? Um, if, if we have, you know, when we're peaking, the biggest goal is to find two to three movements that an athlete can do, and we should be cutting this for social media. If we want to peak, we got to find two to three specific exercises that are going to be done in the weight room that will transfer to that specific sport. So in the case of a, of a vaulter, of a pole vaulter, we have to find, like, let's say a muscle up into, uh, you know, kipping our legs through or kicking our legs through and, and doing a specific exercise like that. Right. So it's going to be almost uniting a technical drill with the resistance based movement. And we've got to do that for about eight weeks and do that at high speed. So it transfers really well when we're peaking. Now, the problem is sometimes we might remove those too early and sometimes we might not put them in long enough. OK, in the past, I've only put them in for sometimes one program. And then I've realized afterwards I should have had that in the program for eight to 12 weeks because they transfer so well and sometimes it takes athletes a little bit longer to adapt to that specific movement to then see the the repercussion the positive repercussion of that sport specificity so it's very dependent upon the specific athlete and the actual sport that they're in to be able to see that 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 positive response so i would recommend going two to three exercises that are sport specific and keep them in for eight weeks and then see what happens at the end of that eight weeks uh, what the, what plays, what play, what days of the five day split should I do cardio? How many days of cardio should I do if I play soccer? Okay. I think twice a week, if you're playing soccer, you're getting quite a bit of cardio just from playing. Right. Um, so if I'm on a five day split, I do a, a, a single, like a lower body power day, upper body power day, an athlete day. I would do an easy cardio, maybe the morning of the leg day. And then I would do an easy cardio, maybe the morning of athlete day. Um, and then rest for two to three hours and then and then do that again. Pratham is saying, Coach, please answer my questions. I'm looking through and I don't see any of your questions, Pratham. Boxing and BJJ. That's all I see that you said. I just see boxing and BJJ. Let me know what that question is. Boxing and BJJ 
does not help me. Um, yeah, so Muhammad Tyson, you know me quite well. So I got asked this question. What sport is the best for you, boxing or wrestling? If I had to pick one sport, and, and let's throw everything out the window for me personally, you know, track and field is like the sport that I'm – watch every weekend i'm watching all the diamond league I'm, I'm setting everything up i'm spending all this time on youtube and 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 watching flow track i spend a lot of time in track and if you took weightlifting out i spent a lot of time in weightlifting not just because i'm i'm engaged in the sport as a coach but i also just love it if you would remove that and then you go okay i love boxing i love watching old school boxing old school videos of winky right one of the best fighters technical fighters of all time I also love watching wrestling, freestyle wrestling specifically. And I like to break down how these guys are moving and just think through that lens. If I had to pick one sport between the two of them, boxing or wrestling, I'm going to go with wrestling. I'm going to pick wrestling. Dude, NCAA wrestling. I mean, they, go watch. You know, Tanner Sloan had a run. He's a, the, the wrestler from South Dakota State. He had a run where he made it to the NCAA finals. I was watching every single match on my phone, screaming at my cell phone, texting the, the coaches, you know, thinking about all the work that, that he's put in and, and his coaches have put in and how much enjoyment it is to achieve, to get to that big stage and to wrestle in the NCAA final. That's, it's, it's, it's just phenomenal. And, and boxing is great. I love watching boxing, but wrestling I do prefer just a little bit more. They're both great, though, to be fair. Um, okay, Coach, please answer my questions if you scroll up. Pratham is still getting at me. Why don't you re re rewrite them in here, Pratham? Best type of strength training for boxing and does lifting weights decrease boxing profa men's? So how should I manage weights and cardio? Okay, so if I was if 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 I was uh, training a boxer, okay, almost all of the focus with boxing would be based around explosiveness, okay, because we don't want to gain weight unless we're a heavyweight. We don't want to gain a ton of weight. I would do resistance-based training in the off-season when they're not in camp. So we would lift weights like outside the season, uh, outside that that eight weeks, you know, that eight-week camp. But really, most of that training is going to be based around power output, explosive work, you know, explosive push-ups, body weight stuff, calisthenics, um, banded works, a lot of banded work, and a lot of trunk work, a lot of pull-ups. Okay, we're not going to really be focusing a ton on, and I'm going to do a lot of plyometrics. It's really going to be basically body weight stuff, pull ups, explosive push ups, banded work, uh, very sports specific because there's so much technical work that goes into a boxing camp. Uh, there's so much technical work that goes into prepping for your opponent that I would not want to take away from that that work. Do you recommend bodybuilding for 13 year olds? Is it OK for use for functional movements? One hundred percent. We got to put this on social media. At some point. Maybe it's maybe a better hook would be like, when are we going to move past in the strength and conditioning world? At some point, we have to move past the fact that bodybuilding is bad. Bodybuilding is not bad. If I've got a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kid, I have an 11 year old right now. Probably 60 percent of the training that he does is bodybuilding based. We're trying to focus on increasing his structural integrity, doing a lot of high reps, increasing his muscle mass creating that stability in those specific joints that might create problems for him in the future, potentially. And then at the same time doing, you know, another 40 to 50% of depending on the percentages that you're using on a given day of sports performance work. So that's where the weightlifting work, the technical coordination, the plyometric work, all that comes in. But bodybuilding is really going to play a major foundational role. That's, I firmly believe that, especially at a young age. Also, bodybuilding let's say you take a 12 year old kid and he's doing five sets of 12 with a slow eccentric he learns really quickly how not to be a bitch because when you're training and you're burning and your pecs are on fire your you know your quads are on fire you have to learn how to be uncomfortable that's one of the best attributes of bodybuilding is that you learn how to deal with stress stress that's physical now Mental stress outside of the fact that you can deal with it inside of the weight room, you've got to go to the therapist for that that part. Um, trust me on that one. So, Pratham, no problem, buddy. Uh, can I get a free men membership for your app? You guys can get a free membership. All you got to do is go to peakstrength.app, and you can download it for seven free days of training. You're going to get five free workouts, and you can do that. Set goals. 
when you get it, so okay, so we've got the peak strength, the, the peak performance planner. We'll eventually release this, but we just use this in-house right now. Is that we set goals, and then when I take the app, I take the app, I write down my goals for the day, I write down where I want to be. I'm trying to train for a marathon right now, so we, we're going, how much mileage am I getting in? And then what kind of training, today's training, all athlete day based uh, to help with my power output. And so we can set goals like that. And that's the big thing with peak strength is that you've got it in your pocket. It's going to help you be more accountable. You've got to do the work. You've got to show up. You know, you've, you've got timers in there so you can't lollygag. And then you can write your goals down inside of your programming, inside of your, your actual analog copy. Uh, which wrestling program of yours should I use? Four months away from wrestling season. So this is from Big Poppy. Big Poppy, what I would do is if you're four months out, I would put my peak point as – I would go into peak strength and I would get get peak strength and select wrestling. You want to train for wrestling. Okay. Say four days a week or five days a week. Select wrestling. Okay. So that's the first step. And then set your peak date as let's say November. Okay. Or middle of November and do that. And then once the season comes, you can alter that a little bit. But that's exactly it. Dude, that will give you absurd results like absolutely insane results if you can hold yourself accountable one of the biggest factors too is that people struggle even think about training for let's say eight weeks eight weeks is one sixth of the year that's in and when you first think about eight weeks oh, eight weeks isn't that long but it's one sixth of the year is a lot of work you're getting a lot of work done in eight weeks so you've got to always be prioritizing with some sense of urgency because when that four weeks passes, now you're another four weeks passing. And now you're going, man, I just wasted a sixth of a freaking year because I was too tentative to freaking go with my gut and actually make uh, those those specific decisions to help make yourself better. I think that that also goes back to I've been really trying to zero in on personally having like four key tenants. I'm going to share these with you. We're getting we're getting really into the weeds here. But one of the one of the things that I, I think that we've got to do is identify, I, you know, no one else has to do this. But one thing that I feel that I have to do is, OK, what am I doing this for? What am I doing this for? I'm either going to be doing this to optimize my happiness, to optimize a relationship with somebody, to optimize uh, some type of uh, power deep inside of me. Like, what does this make me feel uh, strong and happy and, and satisfied. And then finally, is, is, is this going to contribute in some way, sense or form for me because I'm older and I have children that rely on me, some type of financial stability. And when we do that and we think through the, the lens of these tenets, that's, that's what you guys can do with your overall training. So I think it's stuff that you got to remind yourself as an athlete. It's like, is this going to help me with one, my, my performance? Is this going to help me with my recovery? Is this going to help me uh, be a more cerebral athlete is this going to hinder any of the first three? If so, don't do it. If yes, do it. Okay. So hopefully that helps. Um, Muhammad Tyson, you've never seen the video where I ate like liver king for a week. I was eating liver and, and uh, heart for a week. Uh, coach, if I do 50 pushups, can I get a really free, <laughs> complete free? Chris, I want you to send me seven days in a row of you doing 50 clap pushups. Test your bench press first. I can tricep dumbbell roll back 70 pounds in each hand for seven reps. Yes, that's strong. Zachary is throwing discus in eighth to 12th grade. Is it possible for me to become a state champ if I throw 120 in the ninth grade? I had an athlete, Evan Arnott. He threw 90 feet, six inches in ninth grade. He threw 196, 10 when he was in high school as a senior and he became a state champion you can 100 percent do it but you've got to hold yourself accountable you've got to get to the circle four to five days a week you've got to lift four days a week don't bullshit yourself don't sit there and say i want to be a state champion and not do the work if you want to be the state champ you're going to show up and you're again download peak strength we've got throwing inside of peak strength so you can get your throws in there then you can send your technical analysis to tech to throws university so now you've got no excuse about your lifting you've got no excuse excuse about getting in the circle you've got no excuse about making your technique better it's there you can do it but you've got to do the work i'm doing a lot of this today 190 feet 195 11 jason coming in there 190 feet of jason <laughs> yeah, i saw that comment jason uh are you still doing the free swole shirt um once you hit 300 tons in peak strength yes um 
So inside peak strength, we have uh, tonnage, tonnage goals, and we also have goals based off of um, how many workouts that you completed. And we do have uh, rewards for that as well. Yeah, we are doing that. Yo, Big Poppy coming in here with sh some shade. Wisconsin wrestling is getting better than Pennsylvania wrestling. No, no, it's not. Uh, it is not getting better than Pennsylvania wrestling. I'm assuming something must something must have happened. If you're saying that is, was there more winners at Fargo or something from Wisconsin? Maybe is that what you're saying? Go look at the NCAA All American list. Um, Keith, as a young athlete or a coach working with one, how and which goals would you set, both for short term and long term, in terms of physical goals? Okay, so what I would do, you know, and I, I almost want to use Zach as an example there. Keith is is first if you would join the private live, I would set this out for you as clearly as I possibly can. I'm begging Keith to join that private live. It's ten dollars a month. Um, so what I would do though is say, all right, the big the big things are physically. Where do you think? Okay, wh where do you want to be at the end of your career? Right. So let's say you have a kid who's in ninth grade. And they want to say about like Zach, they want to achieve, they want to bench press 405. They want to back squat 450, right? You, so you set these goals and then you work backwards. You say, okay, in four years, we want to work towards that goal. Then the next thing is, okay, for, so right now at the end of this year, for us to get to that point, we've got a bench press 250. We've got a back squat 315. We got to clean whatever. Now to do that, you've got to train four to five days a week. So you go through the tests and then you say, all right, now we've got to train four to five days a week. So then you meet with them. Okay. I expect you to be in the gym four days a week for the next 20 weeks. And then you actually hold them accountable. One of the biggest things that I think for us here at garage strength was that I was texting like all of the time when we first started the gym, where are you? Why aren't you showing up? Why aren't you doing this? And then that created the culture of accountability. And then once the, the culture of accountability came, then it was the clients hold themselves accountable. Even today, if you went down there, yo, where were you? Why weren't you here the other day? Why'd you miss day three? You know, that's, that's consistent. So it's like you set the long term and then you reverse engineer backwards. And then you also tell them based off of this, you've got your goals and you got your ideals. The ideal is a 450 back squat, a 405 bench. The goal would be, to get to that point, you have to hold yourself accountable with these specific tasks, which means getting into the weight room four days a week, um, doing speed work two to three days a week, making sure your recovery is on point. So you've got to uh, meet your macros, all those things. OK, so that's uh, that's what I would do. Is this pre-recorded? Boba Lobs, this is not pre-recorded. Can I have a shout out? You just got it. Appreciate your work, Dane. Could I just front squat instead of back squat and single leg squat for eight week blocks? Yes, you could, Samuel, 100%. Uh, you could definitely do that. Um, yes, yeah, start with the front squats and see how you feel. Wyatt, also, do you have any uh, suggestions for how to make my own Nordic curl? Set up a set up at a gym without a Roman chair or glute hand machine? Uh, if you have a friend that can hold your ankles down, um, you can, sometimes you can do it on like a decline bench. Just be careful. Sometimes it can hurt your knees. Um I thought Askren was in Missouri. Yeah, Young Guns is in PA. But okay, go go Big Poppy. Go look at the NCAA All Americans last year. All right, I gotta get to work. I gotta go. I gotta. I gotta go coach the weightlifters. Um, Zach just commented: Nordics have been crazy for heel hook strength and bouldering. That's freaking cool. I had not thought of that. Wow, Zach. I need to remember that because that's a very good uh, point of awareness. Um, heel hook and bouldering. Wow. I'm writing that down. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. This is like one thing I do too is I just write stuff all over my here. Uh, bench throws in USLS contrasted with quiz variations get me potenti potentiated as, as F. Drop lunges and drop cosmics with focus on eccentric allow me to boulder way more aggressively. I'm glad to hear that. Um, Zach, if you, dude, if you would just DM me or at Ghostface D. Milla or send us that, I don't know if you would be down to put that on uh, our website. That'd be awesome. We would really appreciate that. 
I, I, that that's really cool. I'm glad to hear that. All right, guys, you heard it here from Zach. You should go pick up uh, a, a good program to help with your training. All these exercises. We got 700 exercises inside of Peak Strength. Um, Four-day splits, five-day splits, three-day split, exercise replacements, everything that you need so that you can attain that peak strength. Because remember, freaks, if you want to become a champion, 